See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. One day, all of a sudden, I came across this Lancet countdown report from 2019 that a child born today would be impacted by climate change at every single stage of life. And that one sentence just really knocked around in my mind and I couldn't get it out. We've talked about the extreme effects that damage the world for our children and our children's children, but they're damaging the world for us right now. And all these studies were emerging on how climate change was driving things like extreme heat, like air pollution, that were associated with negative birth outcomes and pregnancy outcomes, right? And those of us who come to healthcare with a desire for social good, to help others, realize that an inadvertent byproduct of what we're doing is harm to the environment. And it's not subtle harm. As I was reading the report, I'm looking out the window at the haze in the air from the wildfires that were burning across the state. It was just a huge connector for me of how these climate environmental determinants were really shaping health. This is one of the areas where clinical colleagues, and especially younger clinical colleagues, are demanding new standards. What could we be doing in our communities and what are places to start? What are those kind of levers? And it turns out there were a lot. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. Climate change and climate crisis. We see it every day in our headlines, research data, looking out our windows, and we feel it, preparing or responding to the most recent climate-related event, often a disaster. Climate change is increasingly affecting people's lives, their health, their livelihoods, and disrupting and overwhelming our healthcare systems and our ability to respond to these extreme climate-related events, as well as interfering with providing even routine care which disproportionately affects Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. According to United Nations, climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Yep, the situation is dire and the stakes are existential. And there are, thankfully, a lot of things we, and when I say we, I mean the healthcare sector, can do to reduce the harmful and inequitable impact of carbon emissions. So while the world is centering on and celebrating Earth Day, we're taking this episode as an opportunity to learn how two clinicians and leaders are inspiring an all-hands-on-deck decarbonizing movement and committing to the Health Sector Climate Pledge. I'm Casey Belgard. I use she, her pronouns, uh, and I'm a public health nurse by training. Over my career, I've cared for patients and families across the lifespan, but the majority of that time has been in city and county health departments and out in the community working with families. I am currently a doctorate of nursing practice in health innovation and leadership student at the University of Minnesota School of Nursing, which is a program very deeply grounded in human-centered design, innovative systems transformation, and planetary health. And the work that I do is to figure out how to increase nursing involvement and influence in the United Nations system so that nurses can better engage with climate and planetary health issues, with human rights, and, and other forms of global advocacy. I live and grew up in New England on the unceded land of the Wampanoag, Poconoke, and Massachusetts peoples. I have a a deep love for the land here, Um, the way the air smells in the fall and the specific shade of blue that is in the ocean water along the coast, the sound of the coyotes that yip across the lake um, from my house. And that's probably where my passion for climate action and planetary health comes from.
thinking back to the earliest part of your career as a nurse, Mm -hmm. when you first started working as a public health nurse, what were you doing? So the earliest, earliest part of my career, I started off uh, as a hospital nurse. I worked on a med surge telemetry floor, but it didn't take me long to find that my thoughts just kept following my patients when they got discharged. I was wondering what was happening to them and um, what their life was like when they left the hospital. And, And for those that kept coming back to us, why that was happening. And so the public health bug caught me pretty early. And I've really spent the rest of my career in public health, working for county and city health departments. I worked for a county health department in Colorado, delivering a program called Nurse Family Partnership. Nurse Family Partnership is a national evidence-based nurse-led home visiting program where nurses are paired with first-time birthing people, visiting them throughout their pregnancy and their baby's first two years of life. It's a program that's been validated through several large-scale randomized control trials. It has a really strong evidence base showing that nurses have a positive impact on pregnancy, birth, early childhood, and life course trajectory outcomes. One of the really cool and innovative things about Nurse Family Partnership is that it meets its program participants where they are. And so it's designed as a home visiting program. But when I was an NFP nurse, I would visit folks at their house. I would visit them on their school lunch or on a break from work. And so really meeting folks out in the community where they feel comfortable, even in a public library or in a park to play with their baby while we talked about child development and what were milestones at this age. So envisioning where are you out in your life? And that's where your nurse is too. Your nurse is following you wherever you are to yes, be there throughout your entire experience. So when we talk about public health nursing, oftentimes we think about taking care of populations. And this is a really wonderful nuance because public health nursing can also be very much one-on-one. As public health nurses, you are in people's lives. You are where they work, they pray, they play. Public health nurses really are the first to see the impacts of the environment that they live in, the communities that they live in, the challenges that they face. So how is it that you make that transition to say, I need to pay attention to environment and climate and nursing needs to be involved in that. That is a really interesting mental shift. Um, How did you do that? As public health nurses, our practice is beyond the walls of the hospital. We get to see these environments that people are living, where they're growing and raising their children, where they're aging, really getting to see a more complete picture of their lives and experience, which allowed me to ask questions around, wow, so the closest green space you have is is how far away if you wanted to take the baby there? And if you wanted to catch the bus for your OB appointment, you have to walk up this, this big hill in the sun in the summertime, right? And so these questions were kind of swirling around in my mind. And then one day, all of a sudden, I came across this Lancet countdown report from 2019 that a child born today would be impacted by climate change at every single stage of life. And that one sentence just really knocked around in my mind and I couldn't get it out. The NFP program is so focused on how can we make things better for these families? How can we increase the odds that they're going to have better outcomes in terms of healthier pregnancy, healthier birth outcomes? Um, And all these studies were emerging on how climate change was driving things like extreme heat, like air pollution, that it was associated with preterm birth and with low birth weight. As I was reading the report, I'm looking out the window at the haze in the air from the wildfires that were burning across the state and the region at the time, thinking about one of my pregnant moms that does have to take the bus to go to her prenatal appointments as she's breathing in this air, thinking about my new young mom with a toddler who loves to play outside, but their family has a history of asthma and they're all breathing in this air. It was just a huge connector for me of how these climate environmental determinants were really shaping health in a way that I wasn't even looking at. And here was this big glaring 
problem that was driving that off course and I wasn't even looking at. And because NFP is so grounded in innovation and the power of nurse-led solutions, it was really an invitation for me to step into this space to say, how does what we do, how is that impacted by climate change? What could we be doing in our communities and our program as nurses to combat these climate impacts that were impacting a, a population that's very vulnerable to them? So if anybody ever wondered if a report had an impact <laughs> you you are living proof because I think oftentimes, you know, these reports get put out there and um, the researchers and the data collectors and the, the writers don't always see how it impacts them. So as you were gathering information about climate and its impact on planetary health, but also human health, where did you go and what did you find out? I started making friends. I started looking for folks that had been looking at this stuff already. Um, and luckily, I found the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments that have really been leaders in making that connection for nurses between health and the environment. And then I also looked for friends within NFP in Colorado. And the Nurse Family Partnership is a national program. And there's so many different entities that administer that program around the country. And there were so many NFPs in every county in Colorado. And we were experiencing so many wildfires at the time that this was going on. And I was wondering, is anybody else also worried about this? Maybe they didn't see the Lancet countdown report that rocked my world, but there's got to be other folks that are interested in this too. And so I ended up bringing together the small but mighty group of NFP nurses in Colorado that were really passionate about climate and health and how it was impacting our families. What do we need to know about maternal child health and climate change? And what are places to start? What are those levers for nursing influence? And it turns out there were a lot. Climate change is a huge problem. And also there's so many great solutions that we can put into place. There are so many things that we already talked to our families about. And for a lot of our families, climate change felt like a I'll think about that if I have time kind of problem. And so it was, you know, using a lot of design thinking and kind of user centered thinking to be like, okay, well, how might this be compelling and useful and actionable for you and how to be healthy and how to prevent exposures that are harmful and still package this information in a way that feels resonant with people and that actually feels like it connects with their lives. And so we ended up creating a resource about climate and health. How can you check the air quality like you check the weather on your phone? And how does that information help you make decisions about taking the bus or having a friend drive you to your prenatal appointment or playing outside with baby or inside with baby on those poor air quality days? I'm watching the wheels in your mind spin and thinking, okay, our individual responses in this way just don't address the existential, behavioral, social elements. We need to be thinking about this more at a policy level. So how does that light bulb go off for you? And once that light bulb does, what do you do in jumping into action? That is exactly the thought process that I was experiencing. And I think that that maybe would resonate with public health nurses in general and nurses in general, right? You get to a certain point where you're like, there's only so much that I can shape here around the conditions that people are living in that I don't have the magic wand for. And what is the magic wand for those things is policy is structures um, and higher level decisions that shape environments in a healthy way or in a harmful way. So it really didn't, it didn't take too long for me to realize that what we were doing was a lot of climate adaptation work. Like how do we help folks adapt to the climate impacts that they were already seeing? And then we also need to 
stop the runaway train (laughs) that is greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We need to mitigate. Didn't take me long to kind of think about there's decisions being made here about my patients and about our communities in spaces that I wasn't in. And so throughout the course of my doctoral program, which is really grounded in systems transformation. I had the opportunity to apply to attend my university, the University of Minnesota's COP27 delegation for the UN uh, climate conference that occurs every year. And I wanted to be there because I wanted to be able to see and tap into these high level climate policy negotiations and, and conversations to see what's happening in these rooms and how are these decisions being made about climate action? And I hoped to be a translator in that process. How could I bring this information back to my patients, to their families, to fellow nurses and and healthcare folks? And then maybe also someday translate that back to policymakers to say, this is how a decision would shape patients that I know in the communities that I have served. Here is the human at the center of your policy. What if we used human-centered design for climate policy? And it, it is really interesting talking about being a translator. It is, let me go to the places where policy is being made so that I can be a trusted messenger back to my colleagues and my community to help them understand this is why these policies get in place. And then also translating to people at the policy level. And oftentimes at the policy level, you're farthest away from where those policies impact people's lives. How novel was, is that for a frontline practicing clinician to be at such an international policymaking convening around climate? How novel you said. It was pretty novel, (laughs) Shauna. I definitely felt like a little bit of a fish out of water. I think in general, the health community at COP has been small, but is growing. The World Health Organization had their first designated space at COP 26. So just a year before I was there. And the health community in general, again, small and not a lot of nurses. I definitely got a lot of questions around why? <laughs> how, did, how did they know you were a nurse? Well, I made the decision before I went to COP that I would wear my scrubs and my stethoscope, which to me felt like first a way to f- find friends, like I mentioned before, right? Find fellow health professionals um, and like-minded folks that saw the connections between climate and health but also to provoke those who weren't making those connections to really have a visual statement that our health rises and falls with the decisions that we make on climate. And I think being able to have such a recognizable uniform in a space like that is a visual reminder for folks of when you're in a power position and you're uh, making decisions about climate that I hope you'll think about health in your decision-making. And I'm realizing when you're saying COP, I can't even remember what the acronym stands for. So COP stands for Conference of Parties. It refers to the annual United Nations Climate Conference where countries assemble to discuss global coordinated climate action. And it's both a a gathering and a process. It it is so many things. The UN itself is such a complex system. COP is such a complex process that has many functions where countries come together. Um, But it's not just countries. There are many folks that are represented at COP, folks from business and industry, folks from civil society, folks from academia and, and research, and they're all coming together on this one specific issue. But I found myself more than once standing in the presence of people from all over the world speaking different languages, coming from different perspectives, and just feeling like, wow, how incredible is it that we are all here because of this one specific issue that the planet and the people on the planet are facing? I think that that is really incredible to be a part of. 
When we had discussed this earlier, you made a statement that I thought was really profound about why it's so critical that nurses are in high level global discussions and processes and decision making. These policies really shape the environments in which we deliver care, in which our patients experience health or disease. And these decisions are being made on climate change and climate action with or without us. And so my question for nurses is, don't we want to be there? Don't we want to be a part of advocating and shaping and influencing these solutions with our patients and our communities in mind? So on that policy vein, we've used the word climate. You also did refer to greenhouse emissions. Um, Most of the broader work and the policy work and where the action is, it's really taking the, the broadest scientific view, which is decarbonization. What's the relationship between climate, greenhouse emissions, and decarbonization so that as we're speaking about this, we're speaking accurately? Sure. So climate change and um, the other planetary changes and that we continue to see have to do with the ways that humans have been living. And for the last uh, 100 years or so, our life has been powered by fossil fuels, which has brought us a lot of gains, but we're also really seeing that it's brought us a lot of harms and a lot of challenges. And when we burn fossil fuels, we're releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The usual suspect that people think about is carbon. What greenhouse gases do, why they're called that is they are heat trapping gases. And so when there's a lot of them in the atmosphere, they trap heat. But when there's too many, it's making the earth too warm, um, is the term most often used, is triggering all these kinds of changes to our climate and to other elements of the earth's natural systems. And so decarbonization is a tool that we have against climate change and for a healthier, more livable planet. There's so much that we can do to transition off of fossil fuels to getting carbon out of the ways that we power our lives and power our health care. Decarbonizing health care is a big topic right now. Health care as a sector is a major contributor globally mm-hmm. and that those health care greenhouse emissions are coming from the stuff we do, the stuff we burn, the stuff we buy hospitals specifically, because that's where so much of this is happening. You're absolutely right, Shauna, that the health sector has um, a part of the problem in terms of using these fossil fuels to, to power what we do and how that's showing up negatively in the health of the people that we serve. If the health sector were a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter on the planet, which if we just think about that for a second, that's really significant. So in the U.S. specifically, we have a lot of work to do. But as you said, there's a lot happening right now. There's a lot of momentum. Leaders like Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health, they have really been helping us wake up to our opportunities for how we can improve health um, in our communities and improve our service delivery, improve our cost savings by getting carbon out of healthcare. I'm speaking with public health nurse Casey Belgard, and she's right. Healthcare and our leaders are waking up, writing prescriptions, and building momentum to decarbonize healthcare. We reached out to the president and CEO of one of healthcare's most influential organizations to learn why decarbonizing healthcare has become a top priority and their role in inspiring collective action. Hi, this is John Perlin. I'm the president and CEO of the Joint Commission. I've been there since March of 2022. I come to that as um, someone who's been at the front lines of healthcare for many years uh, in academia, Virginia Commonwealth University, and the VA. I had the great pleasure of leading the VA system, and most recently as the president of clinical operations and chief medical officer of HCA Healthcare. As I come to this role, I bring those frontline experiences. So the Joint Commission 
is a non-governmental organization. And uh, I would bet that most healthcare workers in the United States have heard of the Joint Commission because we come to um, most hospitals and healthcare organizations, ranging from nursing care centers and ambulatory surgical centers, all sites across the continuum, but especially in hospitals to evaluate quality and safety. What may not be known is that we're an international organization and we work in 75 additional countries and we work and, and learn from hospitals that compared to the United States are, are less sophisticated. And we work in hospitals that have uh, equivalent sophistication to, to what we have here. Our arena gives us things that we have to do from CMS and OSHA, national fire protection, et cetera. But there are things that we want to do working with hospitals, health systems, and healthcare leaders like nurses to really be sure that we can create the environments that offer communities the best services, that offer patients the highest quality and greatest safety, and offer uh, healthcare workers the safest and um, healthiest working environment possible. So you've asked why is the Joint Commission interested in decarbonizing healthcare? This became a, a priority for the Joint Commission based on my experiences at the front lines of healthcare over the rest of my entire career. I saw it during the peak of the pandemic, the displacements, the disparities in, in health outcomes. And uh, so as part of our Joint Commission Help HELP agenda, the H stands for health equity. The second is E, environmental sustainability. And we've talked about the extreme effects that damage the world for our children and our children's children, but they're damaging the world for us right now. And those of us who come to healthcare uh, with a desire for social good, to help others, realize that an inadvertent byproduct of what we're doing is harm to the environment. And it's not subtle harm. 9% of the U.S. carbon footprint is from healthcare. We are 27% of the global carbon footprint in healthcare. Even China is only 17%. And China and the United States essentially create more than almost the rest of the world combined. So we have a huge opportunity here to leave the world better for our children and our children's children, but also to arrest the damage for the world that we're experiencing today. And there are some things that we can do. We tend to think about carbon emissions in three buckets. These are sometimes called the scopes of greenhouse gases. First bucket is the stuff that we do. The second bucket is really the stuff we burn to fuel our vehicles or to heat, cool our physical plants. Um, the third bucket is, by and large, the stuff that we buy. In terms of the stuff we do, that's 7% of the total carbon footprint of healthcare. It almost exclusively relates to two areas. The first is the meter dose inhalers. If we switch from meter dose to dry powder inhalers, that would eliminate about half of that 7% carbon footprint. The second part is in the area of fluorinated anesthetic agents, isofluorine and desfluorine. There are two of the really big contributors to the carbon footprint from anesthesia. Uh, and there are ways that we can diminish the flow rate of that so there's less blow-by on the patient within the FDA allowances. But the other is that there are are other alternative anesthetics or approaches to anesthesia that don't use uh, fluorinated hydrocarbons at all. And to the extent that we do that, we can not only uh, reduce our carbon footprint, but in many instances, save money. The second bucket is um, uh, really how we use fuels for our vehicles and our physical plants, as well as water. We all know that when we replace our light bulbs with LEDs, when we replace our, our windows, when we move to Energy Star and LEED certification, that there's ultimately a positive return on investment. It takes a while. If we don't have the capital, we can't get there. But this is a really important area. But you've probably done the math already. 82% of the carbon footprint is really in the purchased goods and services. Uh, so to the degree that when we buy these products, we use them conservatively. We try to avoid single use, that we reprocess to the greatest extent possible. But importantly, when we buy, we ask for things that carbon label. Today, if you went into a computer store and wanted to buy a computer mouse, you would find that it has a carbon footprint label on it. And you could actually go to the grocery store and you can compare calories on saturated fat on a food label. We need to insist that the products we buy have that same sort of carbon labeling so that the similar product with a lower carbon footprint at the same price or even at a lower price is the purchase we make. What we're asking is to spend smarter and pay attention to that carbon label and do what we can and 
nurses are so absolutely central uh, into to the operations of healthcare that your voices can really help us. We know we've heard feedback from health administrators that they're they're challenged right now, and um, this is difficult for them to take on. But we need your help, really starting a movement in health equity, in avoiding climate change, and maintaining environmental sustainability. This is one of the areas where colleagues, particularly clinical colleagues, and especially younger clinical colleagues, are demanding new standards. So we really appreciate your work and helping to help others understand why this has to be a priority. So, John Perlin, can you make that connection for us of why is decarbonizing healthcare a health equity issue? The burden of climate change is creating excess in terms of disease burden, whether it's waterborne diseases, whether it's uh, exacerbations of um, respiratory and cardiovascular. But the same factors that disproportionately lead traditionally vulnerable populations to have excess burden of disease means that they're the least able to compensate for extremes of weather, whether it be heat or, or, or cold. They just can't pick up and move. In other words, they simply can't buy themselves out of the challenges. And this is why the Department of Health and Human Services didn't start an office of climate change in healthcare, but office of climate change and health equity. So climate change is not only a social justice issue, it's a health issue. And it's not only a health issue, it's a health equity issue. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for decades of a career that have been taking care of people, leading systems, and inspiring all of us to be the very best clinicians and citizens that we possibly can be. Well, Shauna, it's great to see you now. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. And big thanks to all those who have been at the front lines of healthcare. I am sure through this conversation, through the work that they're already doing, we'll think not only of the patients in front of them, but the world around us. That was physician and president and CEO of the Joint Commission, John Perlin. Let's return to our conversation with public health nurse, Casey Belgard, and get her take on the connection between climate health and health equity, and for some of her thoughts on how we decarbonize healthcare. My favorite part of this recognition of why this is so fundamental for healthcare to be a leader in decarbonizing is because it's a matter of health equity. It has boundless potential for the ways that it can advance health equity specifically. We know that Black and brown communities, indigenous communities, low-income neighborhoods are disproportionately located near the entire life cycle of fossil fuels, from extraction to processing to transport to combustion. Those are not located near wealthy white neighborhoods. Um, They're located near already marginalized communities. Black Americans are nearly twice as likely to breathe polluted air, which is associated with higher rates of chronic disease and things like lost work days and and premature death. And so the call for health systems to shift away from fossil fuels is really an, an opportunity to advance health equity. And so depending on how we decarbonize, it could still perpetuate those same inequities. There's research showing that poor uh, households are four times less likely to have access to solar panels than higher income households. These are things that we have to be thinking about. How can we justly transition in a way? So it's not just how do we get carbon out, which absolutely would have gains for communities disproportionately impacted by the burning of fossil fuels. But how can we make sure that when we do decarbonize and we do transition, that we do it in a way that prioritizes those communities most impacted? Yeah. So the health sector climate pledge, what is it? Who issued it? Who's joined it? Yes. So we talked about lots of momentum, right, for decarbonization in healthcare. And part of what is helping that move along is in 2022, the White House and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services invited 
stakeholders across healthcare. So that's hospitals and health systems, but that's also pharmaceutical companies and suppliers to commit to action on climate change. Those who take the pledge, they commit to cutting their organizational emissions <laughs> in half by 2030 and achieving net zero by 2050. They commit executive leadership to the emissions reduction work, meaning that there's buy-in from the very top of the organization. And they also commit to inventorying their scope three or supply chain related emissions by next year, which is a really, really big chunk of emissions that we need to be looking at in terms of the goods and services that we use, that we purchase, that we transport to, yeah. to make our healthcare go around. It means a lot of things and it can feel for organizations that are embarking upon decarbonization, it can feel like, oh, where do we start? But the good news is there's a ton of places to start and there's a ton of solutions that are readily available. And so to highlight a couple Energy is a big one. We've been talking about energy already, and, it, and that's probably the thing that people think of most when they think about decarbonization. We need to stop using fossil fuels, which means we need to use a cleaner form of energy. But for a, a small community hospital, what that might look like is there's actually a lot of potential in energy efficiency. A great example is the OR. ORs are very energy intensive in hospitals. And so even simple changes, hospitals have seen benefits in reducing the um, airflow exchange rates when ORs aren't in use, which isn't something that you'd maybe think of. So hospitals that have done that, they see a lot of cost savings and they see a lot of carbon savings. There's an incredible health system out in the Midwest, Gunderson Health System, that has used all kinds of renewable energy to become completely energy independent. And they do it all with renewable energy sources, which is incredible. And it's nice to have case studies like that. And that there's folks that have gone before that have led the way to make this feel a little bit more of a doable process. And there's a great resource called the Climate Action Playbook for Hospitals by the Healthcare Climate Council. And they have just a treasure trove of great ideas of places to start and these case studies of what other hospitals and health systems have done. The other thing I'll highlight is waste. In my early career, when I worked in the hospital, I cringe now at the amount of single-use things that I threw away, or I would bring excess linen into the room because what if I needed it, but then I didn't need it. And then, you know, there's just so many ways that we can adapt our practice to just make more carbon smart decisions about what we do in, in healthcare. So waste, some hospitals will waste 30 pounds of food per patient bed per day which is a lot. And so waste is a huge opportunity within decarbonization. So nurses are critical to healthcare decarbonization. It really can't move forward without us. There was a recent policy dialogue that the American Academy of Nurses hosted earlier this year talking about nursing's role in healthcare decarbonization. Dr. Don Berwick was the keynote speaker. One of the things he said really stood out to me, and, and that was that nurses are the heart of healthcare. And when I think about decarbonization, I also think that nurses are the engine of healthcare, that we are really the force that moves healthcare forward. We are the largest part of the healthcare workforce. And so it is absolutely essential that nurses get involved in this work. And luckily, there are so many things that we can do to get started. I had the privilege a couple months ago of, of working with one of the lead scientists from Project Drawdown, an organization that has been an incredible leader in climate solutions. The scientist was Dr. Paul West, and we were able to work together to try to distill what are those climate solutions that are readily available, that are impactful, and that are close to nursing influence? What are the ways that nurses can mobilize the 
numbers that they have, the trusted voice that they have to influence their workplace, their organization, their communities, and good for equity of the people that they serve. This work on climate action, on planetary health, is so important. And there's so many different ways to be an activist and an advocate for climate that can be in alignment with the way that you practice as a nurse and the setting that you practice in. Yeah. And to broaden that out, we're, we're naming nurses mostly because it is the largest segment of the healthcare workforce. And we just are, um, we're as much as the problem as we are going to be a part of the solution, but this is an all hands on deck. And so when we talk about decarbonizing healthcare, it's all of us need to be doing that. And what I think um, is interesting about nurses leading is just because there are so many of us Mm -hmm. that our actions collectively are probably going to have the biggest impact on helping us to achieve those goals. This is an inviting everyone event. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. And we need everybody's particular set of skills and expertise. It's true that if nurses were not involved in decarbonizing healthcare, it is unlikely that it would get done. It is everybody's open invitation to join us and, and help us get work done on this really big problem that has a lot of solutions open to us. It really does. I think most of the discussions around climate do not have people laughing. They do not have people smiling. So I really appreciate the cheerleader voice in you, Casey, that is backed by so much evidence, uh, so much data, so much research, so much empathy. And again, tying it back to how it shows up in our lives and in our communities, you know, taking it from policy to people is, is a really beautiful skill that you have. And I feel a lot safer and a lot more optimistic with people like you leading this charge and helping us make sure that we've got a healthy planet. So on that, I just want to say thank you so much. Your thoughts on why the youngest part of our healthcare workforce is probably going to be some of the best and most important leaders in decarbonizing healthcare. It's a great point, And it resonates as you're saying it that. I mean, the whole reason that I feel moved to do climate work and to focus my my studies and my work in planetary health is because I want to leave a better planet for the generations coming behind, right? I want to be able to answer to them and say, we were doing all we could to bring forth a healthier future. And that's what young people are craving. And that includes nurses entering the workforce. When I was in nursing school 10 years ago, a climate change wasn't mentioned once in my curriculum. And that's not the fault of the program. It's just not something that we were really aware of. The impacts to our health were not being drawn as clearly as they are now. But students entering school now at all levels, entering an advanced practice, they are demanding education that prepares them to be climate first responders, to be sustainability advocates, decarbonizers, to be planetary health healers. That's the knowledge that they need to be able to be an effective workforce that's responsive to the changes that we're seeing in our lives and in our healthcare. Special thanks to our episode guests, public health nurse and climate first responder Casey Belgard and physician John Perlin, president and CEO of the Joint Commission, for their leadership and enthusiasm in making everyday Earth Day and decarbonizing healthcare so we can reap all the health, equity, and planetary benefits decarbonizing brings forth. Carbon Smart Practices and Choices about what we do, what we buy, and what we burn are critical in lowering the health sector's carbon footprint and can drastically lower healthcare share of the U.S. carbon emissions, while also building a brighter, greener, and more equitable future for generations to come. There is a tremendous need and urgency to activate every molecule of the health sector in our decarbonizing practices. And while it can feel 
overwhelming knowing where to start. As Casey and John have shared, there are so many places and fantastic friends and resources to help pretty much every carbon step of the way. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening and making carbon smart choices. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on CU Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit cunowpodcast.com.